Hey guys, Veronica here. I'm in the field today and I was thinking that since we've passed the midsummer point, it's probably a good idea to give you guys an update as far as what's been going on in this space. I know we've been focusing a lot on the forest and all of the things from the greenhouse that are going out into the nursery and uh, the IMO process for the Korean natural farming stuff I'm digging into. And that last part, like this is really why I'm getting deeper into figuring out how to better support the microbes that live in this space. So um, behind me here is a 5,000 square foot plot that I've been working on since kind of the beginning of the year since I first got back here. And there's little tests going on throughout it just to see um, what the space can support as far as plant life uh, without you know much amendments or fertilizer or compost or mulch or whatever um, and I've just been sort of working through this process as I go trying to give adequate amounts of support to these plants without um, over inundating the life that lives in the soil and trying to figure out you know what's here and since I got my soil test back this past week uh, we can kind of cover that a little as well as to why um, plants are stunted like um spoiler alert there's no nitrogen in the soil at all but there's lots that we can do in order to get it into a space that it's workable so we're going to kind of move around throughout it and i'll show you what's going on and some of the ideas that i'm playing with and hopefully you leave from watching this video with some of those ideas that you can maybe apply to your own spaces so let's get started <laughs> So the first two rows of my fields, the rows that are closest to the north facing wind, I decided to plant corn because I really wanted a windbreak. Now as you can see this corn is not very tall so I'm not sure how much wind it's breaking. But as we move deeper into the fields and more towards the south, what happens is there's a lot more growth. So I'm thinking maybe it's doing a little bit of its job and it's just harder to tell. Now, this corn would be taller had I dumped tons of nitrogen and synthetic fertilizers on the soil, but that wouldn't solve my problems long term. And it's something that I'd have to reapply every year. So what I've been doing instead, prior to knowing my test results and knowing how low the organic matter was in this space, other than just feeling the dirt, but also um, actually having uh, like qualitative and quantitative analysis to kind of stack my hunches against, um, what I've been doing is putting nitrogen fixing plants in this area. So if you've been following along since the beginning, we had the Austrian winter peas and now I have black eyed peas for my summer cover crop. They do the same thing as the winter peas where they're going to fix the nitrogen into the soil from the air and start building up a little bit more of that organic matter back into the soil. Now these guys, um, I'm not expecting crazy production from this year and I'll show you these these black eyed peas because they kind of did them in like little trenches and they're just <laughs> they're doing pretty well I did not have enough seeds so one of the things that I'm gonna have to pay attention to in the coming months is just making sure that I can save enough money to buy cover crop seed to cover this entire field for fall and winter since that's really the best time for us to try and build biomass here Whereas in the summer it gets super hot. But I have um, a couple different kinds of corn, which is not a recommended idea, but I don't like to play by the rules. So I have a, a flower corn that's from Paraguay that is a shorter season. They're actually both shorter seasons because the other one's a sweet corn that's a locally grown seed that um, was highly recommended <laughs> by one of the small seed banks here. And so what I did was I came through, and I have a few more coming up, but I came through on these guys and you'll see they're all missing their tops because I tasseled them and I had been hand pollinating all of these cobs of corn because there's really not that big of a row so if you have like a hundred of them and they're not planted in a block because you're trying to achieve something else aside from just getting corn but I'm trying to achieve you know blocking that north wind then um, hand pollinating them is not a huge chore I'm definitely seeing them trying to produce and I'll show you they're trying to produce seeds where you'd normally get tassels coming out, which can be a little bit frustrating. But again, that's a byproduct of um, the lack of nitrogen, the lack of organic matter. Like plants want to produce seed to carry on those genetics the following season. And so they're gonna do whatever they can in order to try and make that happen. Even if it means, you know, stressing out and producing it 
in the spots where you wouldn't normally get it. So I definitely have, again, there's tassels producing seed. <laughs> but it's always a fun experiment. I'm looking forward to the day when I have, you know, the eight or 10 foot tall corn that will indicate that there's plenty of organic matter and nitrogen and all of the other trace nutrients to support a tall grass crop like that. But as we look around, um, there's also in between the corn and I had squash beetles come through and wipe out literally every winter squash, pumpkin, etc. that I had planted because I had kind of a three sisters thing going here. Um, but in between them, I also have these beans. And so there's some nice beans popping up that are doing all right. I don't think that we're going to have winter squash between them. I'm probably going to go back and try and plant them again once this round of insects dies down. Uh, I was handpicking them all and really trying to control the population to some extent and it just wasn't working out. So I'm going to try and let that life cycle die out and then put more seeds in because we're halfway in the season. So I technically sort of have enough time to try again, but it's getting a little late for that. So we're going to move over to the beans rows. I really want to talk about land race seed. Uh, the Paraguay corn comes kind of close to what you can get commercially as far as land race, but the real stuff is definitely something to behold. So let's move over there. All right. Now, as we move deeper into the field, you'll begin to notice that the ground cover becomes a little more dense. And I think that part of the reason for this is um, the borders that I have, the, as you can see behind me, sort of like this wildlife border, wildflower border, as well as the things like the rows of corn um, another row of flowers that I'll show you in a little bit. All of these things help to block the runoff and increase infiltration on these interior plants. Now, a lot of this grass that's around me is actually Johnson grass. And for many farmers, it's kind of the scourge of the earth because it's just so prolific. But for me, especially seeing my soil tests and seeing that they recommend potentially growing turf um, or turf crops, I'm guessing like hay and straw and that sort of stuff, alfalfa, and high biomass producing crops. Well, if I don't have the cash to plunk down some seeds and it's the middle of summer and we might get some rain, but I can't guarantee that everything's going to get watered, then working with the natural plants that already exist in this space makes sense to me because this grass will produce um, pretty intense biomass that I've been using as straw to mulch these rows. You can see right here, like it's starting to break down, but it's helping to retain some moisture around my crops, as well as it mows nicely. Like it's just, it's starting to stay fairly short versus like sticking up straight. I have um, a ton around the borders that's just like six feet tall, but <laughs> this right in here, like once you start mowing it, it just kind of forms this really nice, dense mat of organic matter to start giving um, a little bit of shade and coverage to the microbes and everything else that lives in the soil. But I wanted to stop in this spot because I wanted to show you my beans. Um, I like to think of them as magic beans. I stopped to visit a farmer who I really admire and that I um, found or she found me on Instagram and um, in New Mexico at the beginning of the year. And I really just wanted to learn from her and try and figure out you know, what the pieces of the puzzle were that I was missing. And one of those things was land raised seeds. Now what's a land raised seed? A land raised seed is a crop that humans have been um, manually breeding for hundreds of years and selecting for various tolerance and resistance. It could be environmental, it could be pest, it could be soil type. Uh, there's a number of things. They tend to also grow in a much shorter season. So for uh, things like peppers, you might see 60 days instead of 90 to 120 days. And they tend to be a really good option if we get into a space as we're starting to get into, where we're seeing this really wonky season, where we're seeing you know, the smaller, shorter windows of what we can grow and when, to have something that is a shorter day length so that if, like this past year, where the Midwest gets pushed out um, on the planting calendar for corn, you can still plant corn because it'll still produce before the next before the first frost. So the beans were where I started. I kind of fell in love with some different types of beans as I was cl helping clean through boxes and boxes of them for seed saving at this farmer's place. And she offered me a few to try and grow out at my own space um, to help 
start selecting for my environment and for an environment that a lot of people exist in and um, just really work on like the germplasm research in this space. So I am very excited. These are in the neighborhood of, I wanna say 60 days now, which is kind of the window that we're looking for. There's still a lot of flowers coming up. They're very happy here. They were originally grown, and these are dry beans, by the way, but they're originally grown, I'll get you a close-up of these clusters because they're just impressive, um, at 6,000 feet elevation in the high desert mountains of New Mexico without irrigation or with very minimal irrigation, which is impressive as well, I think. Like, they're just, overall, they impress me. I have other beans growing around this space that are um, just, you know, organic, conventional, like standard, what you can get from most seed catalogs. And none of them are as prolific as these guys who originally grew in what is called farming Alcatraz by um, many people who grow in that space. But you'll see that they're starting to produce, they're starting to climb up these stick trellises that I gave them. I did the trellises because I like having a spot for birds to land as they're hunting insects in this space. I see mockingbirds and scissor tails and stuff on those and the sunflowers all over. But also these guys started climbing, so I gotta reset these trellises a little. But they're, um, they're starting to climb up and then what's gonna happen here is I will wait until they're done at the end of the season um, and pull up the entire plant, at least one or two of them, to see um, how the root nodules are working out as far as that nitrogen fixation, like how these plants, because look how big and green and bushy this guy is, like it's got to be fixed on some level of nitrogen um, in order to exist like that in a field that doesn't have any organic matter. And you'll notice as I go through um, that there is, I have added a little bit of mulch to this space. So I found a bagged mulch from just like the big box store that's a locally created one that I really, really like. And I've been using a little bit of that in combination with the cut Johnson grass, with the co uh, cut weeds, a little bit of compost, um, some trace minerals, a little bit of Korean natural farming outside of like doing the entire cycle, just playing with how can I better support the life in this space. And so I have, um, these guys were the, what are they? These are the Zuni Pueblos, which I think those were like four or 500 years old. I don't even remember the original seeds. It's something hundreds of years old. And then I have some Hidatsa Reds. And these are all, again, they're, um, we're testing them for insect resistance, for disease resistance. Like these guys are starting to yellow out. So there's certain types that might not do well in my space and that's okay, but it's better to know before you need to know. So growing food for the future with lots of trial and error. We've got some more that are climbing over here. And again, we're looking to see like, what's the sort of resistance that we're working with here. And so this first season, I'm not going to do any sort of, aside from like um, the lactobacilli that I'm using to treat uh, certain, you know, rust and disease issues on various plants. Like I'm not super feeding or super treating anything. Like I want to see how these seeds can perform in a suboptimal environment um, with very little interference and go from there. So let's move over to the next row. That's where some peppers are hiding as well as a few other fun things and talk about that. So the beans sort of continue in this area right here. Um, it's garbanzo beans. And I just think that they are one of the most beautiful plants I have ever grown. They're just beginning to flower in some spots. Um, one of the things that you might notice in this space, uh, one, that my rows are really narrow, and that was just a planning thing. Um, I wasn't entirely sure how I wanted to block out the rows at the point of planning, and so I probably made them about half the width that they should be because I don't have a broad fork yet, and that was a lot of aerating just on its own. Uh, but another thing is that there is a huge amount of diversity in here as I go in for these close-ups you'll see things aside from the crop that I want, um, like chamomile, like Tulsi, like various lettuce and chards and dill and other basils and all kinds of stuff. Um, and that was a really, really intentional decision. Again, because this field is lacking in biomass um, and it's lacking in species diversity since a lot of it 
tends to die back after the spring and then you go into the summer and we just have a lot of grass and thistles. I wanted to really make sure that I could add a little more life, um, a little more support for pollinators, for other insects, um, for myself. <laughs> and I think that that's working out pretty well. One of the things that I did in order to accomplish that, um, rather than just randomly broadcasting the seeds, was that I very intentionally, as I was mixing up top dressings for these rows, I very, very intentionally mixed in, you know, a splash of Tulsi seeds, a dash of lettuce seeds, um, a little bit of dill, a little bit of fennel, all of like my favorite pollinator attractants, some herbs that are harder to grow, like papalo. Um, when you start it in a pot, like it's not happening, but you throw it out in the wild and it just springs up everywhere. So seeing, you know, too, like what can be supported and also trying to plant things in between my crops that will either feed other insects or feed, uh, feed other insects that would eat my crops or feed beneficial insects that will eat the pests on my crops. And I just noticed there's a little chickpea already. Oh my gosh, that's so exciting. That's the first one I've seen so far. So, God, they're so cute. Um, as we get deeper into this row, this is where some of the land race peppers come in. And so I have a couple of these Mirasol peppers. They're um, from the USDA seed bank. And I got a few to come up. There are a few that got eaten by things. That's okay, I only need a handful in order to get um, you know, decent results and some seeds off of them. We've got some flowers coming in on this one. And the other ones are starting to bud. And those are, um, they've been grown out in the last couple of years, but not too recently. And so this was one that was like, here, try your hand at this one. If this one works out, like we'll talk about others. Um, I have, as we move further back, there's some spots that have been replanted. There's a couple little guys in here. And these are all direct sown. Like everything in this field that is existing is direct sown. I did try and do some transplants. It did not work out because the shock from moving into the native soil without germinating in the native soil, like something happened there. So everything that's popping up now is here. <laughs> and that's what's gonna be here. And that's the beauty of planting way more things than, or a high diversity of things and way more of them than you think that you'll need is that you're bound to get something. And so it's like every time I'm adding compost or mulch or top dressing, um, I'm throwing seeds in the ground any place that there's a bare spot just to try and get that green biomass on top of the soil, the roots in the soil, um, the infiltration started, those microbes being supported. Like we're looking at a very holistic solution to what should be a simple problem if you had soil that was good to begin with. So I've got these little tiny peppers. These are kumari peppers. Um, I want to say they're Brazilian, but I'm not entirely like don't quote me on that But these guys are finally starting to pop up the ones that I did in the greenhouse just like they're totally toast so I'm so happy these are coming up here and Tons and tons and tons of Tulsi, but that's okay because I have friends that are herbalists that will use it all day long So that will probably get harvested and shipped out here shortly um, A few more beans in this row. These are ones more for our own consumption than land race and then some really struggling last of the Mohican squash down here, winter squash. I don't know that they're going to produce, but that's why we're going to try and break the cycle here shortly for the squash insects and um, plant another round and see if we can't at least get a little bit of something. Uh, this next row is one of my favorites and uh, I will show you why here shortly.